It already feels like it's been a full service. And if you've at all been paying attention, you will already have been ministered to through our worship singing and through testimony. Sometimes when we were on long road trips, we would play word association. I'll say a word, and you take note of the thoughts of where your mind goes when I say it. Ready? Fear. Where does your mind go when you hear the word fear? For me, I think of evenings when I walked home from my grandpa's place after having played chess with him, and it was dark down the road, and I walked along, and especially in wintertime, you could kind of hear the echo of my footsteps on the trees beside me, and I started thinking about who might all be in those trees, and I started walking faster and faster, and eventually I was in an all-out dash to make it home. Or times when I was in the basement and the light switch was at the top and mom or dad walked by and they switched off the lights not knowing that I was down there. (laughs) And I whipped up those stairs and I bounded up there faster than I could ever do it without with the lights on. I remember another time being at my team leader's place. I went to, to South Korea when I was 17 and a couple years later we had a we had a team reunion in Illinois in the countryside. And uh, we were staying, most of us, we were staying at his house, and then in the evening, we guys, for night, we stayed at his in-law's place. And so it was about a mile and a half walk, and in the Illinois cornfields, it was kind of a winding road and a little bit up and down, but the corn is right up against the asphalt. And so me and a guy from Montreal and a guy from New York, we were walking along, and I was this country bumpkin from Blumenort, and they were telling me about all the different murders that had been going on in their cities. (laughs) And we were going on and on about this, and my eyes were already big because this didn't happen in Blumenort. And then what we didn't know is the other guys had gone ahead with the van and had parked just over the hill and they'd walked back in the cornfield and they waited for us. And so as we're walking along talking about murder things going on in these big cities, they started running in the cornfields beside us. I was terrified. My blood pressure still goes up when I think of that moment. We all climbed on top of each other. We were so petrified. So terrified. I think of a time at the Morris Stampede and I was 16 years old and finally built up enough courage with a friend of mine to go on the zipper. I was so scared. I was hoping that thing would stop long before that ride was over. Some of you might think of thunderstorms at night and the lightning and the crack of the thunder. We haven't heard that in a while, but we'll hear it again in a while. One summer night during a severe thunderstorm, a mother, not me, no, it wasn't me this time, was tucking her small son into bed and she was about to turn off the lights when he asked in a trembling voice, Mommy, will you stay and sleep with me tonight? And she gave him a reassuring hug and rubbed his head tenderly and said, No, I can't. I have to sleep with Daddy tonight. And it was quiet for a while and he said, What a big sissy. <laughs> Some of you think of phobias you might have. I have a bit of a claustrophobia. A number of years ago when I I went into the MRI machine, and some of you know what that's like. It's a little round cave thing, and they put you on a bed, and they begin to slide you in there, and they were going to scope, they were going to scan my knees. And and some of you have gone all the way in there. I didn't have to go all the way in, but as that bed was getting closer and closer to that little opening, and I was going in further and further, I was so relieved when they stopped with my head still sticking out. Because... Being inside that MRI machine would cause panic for me. Climbing into a snow tunnel or a bale tunnel is enough to make me go crazy. And I still blame my older brothers for locking me inside a bale tunnel for giving me that claustrophobia. Researchers at Hopkins University report that 30 years ago, the greatest fears for school children in America were, number one, animals. Number two, being in the dark. Number three, high places. Number four, strangers. And number five, loud noises. Today, kids who are, uh, or uh, kids in elementary are afraid of the following. Number one, divorce. Number two, war. Number three, cancer. Number four, pollution. Number five, being mugged. Things have changed a little bit. I'm going to talk today about fear. Fear. What is it that we are afraid of? The dictionary defines fear as an alarm or dread caused by impending danger or uncertainty. Sometimes it's a sudden adrenaline rush kind of a thing where your brother jumps out and he gets a kick at us scaring the bejeebers out of you. Never happens to you, does it? I didn't think so. Other times it's a prolonged state of mind where you feel like you're in a dark place and you just can't get out and you're terrified. 
It said that years ago, the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin so feared for his safety that his residence in Moscow contained eight bedrooms and he slept in a different bedroom every night and he wouldn't tell anybody because he was afraid that somebody was going to kill him. Pretty ironic that the guy who tormented and killed millions of people lived with that level of fear. Fear has a close kin that we might call worry. It's like a double first cousin. It's a troubled state of mind, a dread for something in the future. One of the common phrases used in Scripture is, fear not. Do not be afraid, which implies several things. First, that people in Bible times lacked courage just like we do today. So human nature hasn't changed a whole lot. It's natural. It's a human tendency to be afraid. Things that are new, things that are difficult, things that are unknown, that are out of control, usually create a reaction of fear in us. And as God moves in history, at different times, he causes that fear. When he interrupts and he adjusts the course of events in order to fulfill his plan, he does things that are out of the ordinary that create fear. So, so the statement coming from God is often concerning these interruptions. He would start off by saying, do not be afraid. When he calls people to do something that looks daunting and humanly impossible, God's call is often, do not be afraid. Just trust me. If you look in your concordance, the majority of the references in the Old Testament that speak of fear refer to the fear of God which is not a terror or, a, or a, a panic in thinking about God, but rather a, 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 a sense of awe and reverence and respect for God. That's a good thing, and that's a very important topic to speak about. That's not what I'm going to speak about today. We're going to speak about the fear, the part where we're, we're afraid of things. There's dozens of examples in Scripture of people who were afraid. They were afraid of the assignments that were given them. Moses was scared of having to go to Pharaoh to ask for the release of God's people. Esther, a Jewish queen, was terrified to go speak to her husband to ask him to spare her people. Joshua was scared to fill the shoes of Moses as leader of God's people. Gideon was terrified to become the military leader of Israel against the Midianites. King Saul, who stood head and shoulders above everyone else, and all his soldiers were deathly afraid to take on Goliath on the other side of the valley. Elijah was supposed to bring Ahab some bad news, and he was petrified. Daniel was scared of the lion's den. Timothy was scared of the task of pastoring the church in Ephesus. Assignments can sometimes overwhelm us and cause us fear. Then there's many examples in Scripture of sudden and unexpected events. The children of Israel were terrified by God's display of power at Mount Sinai when the whole mountain shook. When angels appeared to Zechariah, to Mary, to Joseph, to shepherds in the field, they freaked out. They were terrified. And the first statement that's made by the angels is, do not be afraid. The disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee in the storm when Jesus walks up to the boat... We're freaked out. Who is this ghost that comes walking to us in the night? James and Peter and John on the hillside with Jesus who were talking when suddenly Moses and Elijah appear and would seem like ghosts, and they were terrified. When these sudden events happen, adrenaline shoots through our body, and sometimes we're frozen at least momentarily because we can't process quickly enough what's going on around us. These sorts of things happen to us too. We see something unexpected or hear something we can't immediately pinpoint the source of, and we're on high alert. Something unusual is happening, and our body responds in an instant. So much is said in Scripture, but I want to just highlight four different passages, and I'd invite you to take your Bibles, and we want to just stop at four different passages. There's literally hundreds that we could stop at, but this, these are the four we're going to stop at. First off, let's stop at 1 John 4, verse 17. 1 John 4, verse 17 and 18. <clears throat> With the folks at Oak View, we're going through, in our Bible study, we're going to 1 John chapter 4. And so this, this verse kind of jumped out at me as I was thinking about this. It says this, 1 John 4, verse 17 and 18. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. John's most frequently repeated word in 1 John is love. He's kind of obsessed with or focused on love. He spent considerable time before this explaining love to us using a number of different approaches. Love comes from God, he says. God is love. As God loves us, let us love one another, he says. To make God's love complete, we need to love one another. And so here in verse 17, John addresses the fear that many of us have lingering in our minds, at least from time to time. In fact, Chris kind of spoke about this last Sunday. I was kind of nervous he was going to steal all my thunder. When he spoke about fear at first, and then he talked about the anticipation of the end of, of Christ coming back. Here in this passage in verse 17, it speaks about fear of judgment, of punishment. Many people do not want to think about the Lord's return or the end of time because it brings with it a certain amount of fear and apprehension. Fear of what will happen. Fear of the unknown. Fear that we may not hear those words we want to hear. <clears throat> Good and faithful servant. And we do not have any, anyone other than Jesus who has been there before. No one has come back and told us what it's like. And so the unknown creates a certain apprehension about the end. <clears throat> On one hand, Jesus makes it clear that if we have faith, we will be saved. If we believe, we will have eternal life. If we love, then we live in us. And yet on the other side, we read verses that broad is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there are that find it. Or we read verses that say, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, didn't we do cast out demons and do miracles and all kinds of things? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. And so that creates a certain uneasiness in, in us. On one hand, I believe, but what about, what about if I'm one of those? He says, I never knew you. And so it creates a certain fear. G John says that fear and perfect love cannot coexist. So what's perfect love? The Greek word here that's used for perfect love is not perfect as in, in not having any defect, but rather perfect as in being made complete. He says earlier in John seven, uh, verse four, chapter 4, there, verse 17, he speaks about, about completing God's love. Um, being made complete. That speaks about the fact that there's, there is a process that happens. And the way that he describes it before this is that God lavishes his love on us. And then in order to make that love complete, we have to share that love with others. That's making it perfect. That's what it was intended to do. John has just spent considerable time in, in chapter 4 explaining how this works. That to make it complete, it first comes down to us and then we pass it on to others. We accept the generous and unconditional of love of God and then we generously extend it to others. So if we love others well, the love of God is made complete in us and then in that person there is a decreasing or less and less space for fear to grip that person. Love being made complete is a little bit like electricity. When it goes out from its source, it doesn't actually have power to do anything unless it can also make its loop and come back, finish its loop. And in the same way, if God lavishes his love on us and we just sit there and absorb it and hoard it and keep it for ourselves, God's love is not made complete. It doesn't, it doesn't actually accomplish, it doesn't actually elicit the power that it was intended to. But when we fully accept the unconditional and sacrificial love of God, we accept it, we grab a hold of it, we depend on it, we embrace it, we consume it, we find refuge in it, our security is found in it, then fear is forced out. And when we're fully drenched in the lavish love of God, and we can't help ourselves but love others, and the Spirit of Christ is in us so that we love others, there is less and less room for fear to find a crack or a perch in our souls and in our minds. And just practically speaking, if we are immersed in loving other people, there just isn't as much time to spend thinking about all the things that could go wrong because we are consumed by the love of God to us and the love of God that we're sharing with others. When we love God and, go and love people, Fear 
is driven out. When fear grows within us, it's also guaranteed that the love for God and love for people will be diminishing. Those two things go hand in hand. Secondly, let's go to another verse. Luke chapter 12, verse 4. Luke chapter 12, verse 4. It says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that cannot do, can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Those who can kill the body but who can do no more would be people, authorities, um, would, have, would have physical strength over you to torment you or make life miserable for you. But all they can touch is your physical body. It might take a toll on you emotionally and psychologically, and without question, there are Christians who have succumbed to this emotional and psychological persecution they faced. But these are people. People can torment you. People can bring physical opposition, physical pain and punishment on you. And God, Jesus says, don't fear those. Don't fear people. Fear the one who has the power to determine your destiny, to throw you into hell. Now, here's a bit of a question that some people raise. Is, is that God or is that Satan? And it's a little bit unclear in the NIV because on one hand, um, it, says, it says, after killing the body, that doesn't sound like something that God would be involved in. Unless that refers to just the end of our lives where physically our bodies no longer function and exist and we die a physical death. And that would seem like it sounds like that would be the work of Satan, killing the body. But on the other hand, the one who has the right or the power to determine heaven or hell, that we would say that's God's role. And so there's some, I think if you have a New Living Translation, I think that one makes it quite clear that this is referring to the work of God. We shouldn't fear people who can trouble us and bring physical pain on us. We should fear God who has ultimately determines our final destiny. I tend to see this as the way of describing the power that God has to determine our final end and that our final eternal destiny is far more important than our earthly well-being for a few years. So if people can physically torment you and destroy your body by imprisoning you or, or punishing you or torturing you, that is one thing, but it is temporary and heaven is eternal. It sounds similar to what Paul says in Romans 8 verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings, and Paul was probably writing from prison, he says our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now that sounds nice, but when we're going through physical pain, when we're going through punishment, torture, um, and many of us don't have a file for that because we haven't been through that. But we know that there are people in our world who are going through that. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who are going through difficult circumstances, who may be imprisoned, who may be being tortured in order for them to renounce the name of Jesus Christ, and they won't do it. I can remember being afraid going to school in grade two and dreading an encounter with the three guys who were a year older or a grade older. They were a couple years older than that. They'd failed a few grades, and their self-esteem was a bit low because of that, but they had physical power over us. They were stronger than us, and they made sure that they tormented us. Physically, I, a number of days I went to school scared that I was going to get beat up just because they could, and on occasion they did. That's about the extent of fear of physical suffering that exists in my lifetime. But already during Jesus' ministry, the hostility towards him was growing. And he knew that it would only increase after he left. He knew that the very disciples he was with would experience physical torture. They would be arrested. They would be imprisoned. They would face the 49 lashes by at the hands of the Roman authority. And some, according to scripture, or according to history, rather, were hanged and some were burned, but they refused to renounce the name of Jesus. The Roman authorities could inflict pain on them but they couldn't determine their final destiny. Jesus is saying, in light of eternity, the pain you face now, the torment you have to endure now, the passing out because of pain overload will be 
because eternity will far surpass any physical suffering that you have to go through here. Remember what it says in the last half of Hebrews chapter 11? Verse 35 and on, it says, Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them, it says. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. That hasn't been your and my existence. But Scripture seems to say that we should prepare for or not be surprised if that is our lot in life. And if that happens, don't succumb to fear of those who can torment us physically. Don't give in to those who oppose us and who stand against us, but rather fear the one who determines our final destiny. Another passage, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. For this reason I remind you, and this is Paul writing to his friend Timothy. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, and in the King James Version it says fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. See, Timothy is a young leader left in charge of a church where many of the people were older than he. And he was timid. He was fearful. It seems here that he does, he does have the gift to lead, but he is very hesitant to step forward and do it and to use that gift. I remember in high school when I became aware that I was seen by some others around me as a leader and people would nominate me to be student body or whatever, my class rep. And I said, no, because I didn't want it. I resisted it. I didn't want to be a leader. I didn't want to stand out from the rest of my friends. I just wanted to be one of everyone else. I didn't want to have to stand and speak and say and lead. I didn't want to be set apart. I was scared. I wanted to be part of the crowd. It's one thing as a young person to be respectful of people older than you. It's another to be afraid to move, afraid to speak up, afraid to lead. I remember when I started as pastor at age 31, those first few ministerial meetings were terrifying for me. There were people there in the ministerial meeting who had been in the ministerial longer than I'd been alive. And, and, and how, what should I say? How should I lead? How could I? Uh, I, was, I was scared. I was afraid of that assignment. That gift of leadership that is in Timothy that needs a little nudge, a bit of a risk, a bit of courage, a bit of honing through practice, that gift needs to be fanned into flame, Paul says. God did not give you the spirit of fear. He gave you the gift of leadership. Fear is not a spiritual gift. God does not give in any of you the spiritual gift of fear. In fact, he says, I don't give the spirit of fear. That is not from me. I often wonder what gifts in this church body among us lie dormant because of fear. In what ways is this body of Christ, or maybe people even outside the body of Christ, being shortchanged, being cheated because of fear that has kept gifts hidden within us? Satan loves fear. Satan loves to hold people hostage in their fears. That is a tactic that he loves to employ. In fact, I think one of the most powerful ways that Satan has a grip on us and on society, besides immorality or family breakdown or addiction, is fear. Fear. If you listen to radio or watch commercials on TV, fear is one of the common motivating factors that people use to get you to buy stuff. Fear. Fear will get you to buy all kinds of things, to create security for your home, for your vehicle, for your life. You buy insurance. You buy security uh, kits for your vehicle. 
You teach kids at school how to respond if there's a gunman that comes in or if there's a, some kind of a warning goes off. We're constantly being motivated by fear. God does not encourage fear. God does not give the spirit of fear. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us, he gives us the title of sons and daughters, of being his children. He declares us righteous. He gives us an inheritance. He forgives our sins. He empowers us. He sets us free, but he does not give us a spirit of fear. That comes from the enemy. Fear is not a spiritual gift. Fear is not a sign of wisdom and of old age. Fear is not an indicator that you are more aware of what could go wrong. Fear is a ploy of the enemy. Instead, it says God has given us a unique combination of power and love. If we just had power, we would probably just use it for our own benefit. We would engage in futile and pointless spiritual battles with our enemies just to prove our superiority. But because God also gives us love, we act for the good of other people. We want them to not have to suffer, if at all possible. We have been given power. What power, you might ask? We have the power of the name of Jesus Christ. We have the power of Jesus to resist temptation. We have the power of the cross at our disposal to say no to sin. We have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to love our enemies. We have the power of God within us to pray for those who mistreat us. We have the power of God within us. We have the power of praise. We have the power of God's word. We have the power of unconditional love within us. God gives us love instead of fear. Love for the very people who might be mistreating us. Love for the very situations and the people involved that cause us fear. Just think about a mother's love. A mother's love causes her to face any and every opposition to fight for her child. We see that in how hard mothers fight for the life of their children, to what lengths they will go to ensure their child's well-being, to what degree they will allow their bodies to be depleted from sleep and food and so on and so on just to seek the welfare of their children. They love. They have the spirit of love. And fear doesn't seem to get in the way of love. I find it interesting that he also says self-discipline. Or in the King James Version, it says a sound mind. God has given us power and love, but also self-discipline as a way of coping with fear. Oftentimes, God has allowed us to think something through rationally or to take thoughts captive through mental self-discipline so that they don't run out of control in our minds. Think just for example. You're at home in the evening by yourself, and it's dark outside, and you hear some noise that you can't recognize, and you don't know why it is or what, where it comes from. And if you just stay there and don't go check it out, your mind has the po potential to go all over the place as to what it might be. Besides the neighbor kids pulling pranks, it could be demons outside doing this or that. And when you grab a flashlight and you go outside and you find it's a piece of tin flashing that's scraping against the house in the wind... It's a sound mind. It's self-discipline. It's a disciplined mind that says, I will not let this fear get out of control. I will go see what it is. And often there's a rational explanation for the very thing that causes us to go completely crazy with fear. One more passage. <clears throat> Isaiah 49. 41, sorry. Isaiah 41. We're going to end on this one. <clears throat> Isaiah 41, verse 9 to 10. <clears throat> Here God is speaking through his Isaiah to the children of Israel who are in captivity. They've been taken from their homeland and they've been, been, been captured by Babylon and they're in, in Babylon. And he says, I took you from the ends of the earth from its farthest corners. I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The people were scattered. Some were taken captive. Some places were, were resettled by foreigners. Some people just moved into, uh, some foreigners, the Babylonians, just moved into land that was, used to be uh, the Jewish territory. 
And many people were in captivity in a foreign land with a foreign language. And the future looked entirely bleak. It didn't look like God knew what he was doing. It didn't look like he was on his throne. In fact, it looked like Marduk, the God of Babylon, was superior to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And God reminds them, Ahem. I gathered you from the far ends of the earth before. Have you forgotten what I did for you in Egypt when it seemed impossible? You were in the grip of Pharaoh and you were his slaves and I brought you up out of Egypt. I've brought you together from the far ends of the earth before. I called you, I chose you, he said. So don't fear, for I am still with you. The same God who parted the Red Sea, who caused Jericho to crumble, who made Mount Sinai shake, is still quietly right here with you in Babylon. And God makes four emphatic declarations that I think we should often claim in our own lives because I don't think God has changed. He says, I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. I'm not far away. I'm right here beside you. And then he says, I am your God. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. This relationship we started isn't over just because the circumstances around you don't look so good right now. I'm still keeping with my bargain. I've let you be captured and you're in Babylon right now, but I am still your God. He says, I will strengthen you. Though you feel weak and helpless sitting in Babylon, though you're now at the mercy of those who captured you, I will strengthen you. You will again have strength. Though the pit of despair seems very deep and there seems to be no light, though you feel emotionally weak and powerless, I will strengthen you, he says. And then he says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's righteous right hand. Most of us are right-handed. And the right hand is our dominant hand. When we want to swing a hammer, when we want to lift something that's, that's heavy, we'll grab it with the right hand, with our dominant hand. God says, I will uphold you with my dominant, most powerful hand. I won't let go of you. I will uphold you. I will be beneath you. I will carry you. So when the road ahead seems dark and hopeless, he's saying, fear not, I am with you. When the circumstances have suddenly come crashing in around you, fear not, I am with you. When you're asked to do something that strikes fear in your bones and you feel totally inadequate and it'd be far easier to just say no, God says, fear not, I will strengthen you. When there's no hope in sight and you've been in a dark, dark place for a long time, a period of grief or a period of depression and inability, it seems, to grab a hold of anything, Fear not, I will uphold you with my powerful right hand. It's much more that could be said about fear. But I want you to go home with a couple of phrases from Scripture ringing in your ears. And in fact, I'd encourage you to memorize these. <clears throat> Number one, God has not given me a spirit of fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Secondly, I will not fear those who can destroy my body, but only the one who determines my final destiny. I will not fear the one who can destroy my body, but only the one who determines my final destiny. Thirdly, perfect love casts out fear. When I soak in the love of God for me and I embrace it and I share it with others, fear is forced out. Perfect love casts out fear. And finally, fear not for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. Another way of saying this would be to say this. God, I will trust you, and I will trust your power. I will trust in the salvation of God. I will trust in the love of God, and I will trust in the constant care of God. For closing song, we're going to listen to, and there's going to be words on the screen, we're going to listen to a song, and I just ask you to reflect on the fears that you have. And I would ask you to give those over to God again this morning and choose to trust Him with them. Go ahead, Sheldon, play the song. <clears throat> and uh, during the song, I'm going to ask us to stand and pray, and then we'll be dismissed. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till 
Father, I pray that you would continue to make yourself known to us, to strengthen us and to uphold us. And I pray, Lord God, where fear grips us, where we are gripped by fear and held in slavery, I pray, Lord God, that you would bring freedom and release. And where we have allowed that fear to grow and we have refused to bring that to you, Lord God, we ask for your forgiveness. We want to trust, Lord God. We want to rest in and be confident as children of the King. And so I pray, Lord God, that today, this morning, we would bring that fear in us to you and lay it at your altar. We pray that you would give us a holy confidence, not in our own ability, but in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would dismiss us with a spiritual confidence and a sense of clarity that we are children of the King and we can walk with our heads held high and be free of fear in this world. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.